Hello and welcome to the webinar Whipping Your Scenario Planning into Shape with Austin Data Labs. Today we have our CEO, Simon Drake, our SVP, Derry Hamish Keston, and our Director of Customer Success, Elmer Rinbeck, here to talk to you about scenario planning. Hamish, why don't you kick it off? Recently, uh, you said in a conversation to me that just-in-time supply chain was dead. Can you talk a little bit more about that for us? Yeah, sure, Liz. Um, so, look, I mean, we've all seen that um, empty supermarket shelves um, waited way longer than usual uh, for online delivery or experienced port uh, or the portal stripping issue problems. Um, it's, it's fair to say, and that's kind of where my comment came from, that lean supply chain and just-in-time delivery is dead. Um, and, and now it's all about um, digital twins, supply chain resilience, um, having contingency and safety stock policies. Um, historically, like safety stock calculations were based on demand volatility and um, target service levels. Now they need to take into account other risks, um, volatility of supply, uh, shipping disruptions, um, and a range of other factors. Ultimately, this is going to mean holding more stock, um, which equals working capital, which comes at a cost um, as interest rates start to rise globally, um, which we're already seeing. Um, this is going to get more expensive. Um, in this context, we need to get smarter about how we manage through this um, and where we choose to hold contingency. And, and to me, this is where scenario planning comes into play. Um, so when we talk about um, scenario planning, if it's going to be sort of comprehensive, robust um, planning capability, it's important for two reasons. Um, the first one's envisaging what might happen um, and then preparing contingencies for this. Um, and then the second reason is being able to respond quickly to what has happened um, and replanning um, in a timely manner. Um, so, so those kind of the key things that I um, I think about um, in terms of that. Um, uh, Alma, it'd be good if maybe you sort of shared um, your thoughts and, and maybe some example, an example from your um, from your experience. Yeah, Hamish, um, thanks for the introduction. I think you've touched on some of those critical points around why scenario planning is so so important. Um, I think what we're seeing is there are different themes to the types of scenarios organizations are looking at. Um, firstly, I think there's relaxing of the boundaries and constraints around their plans. Um, you may have a plan based on a range of inputs, for example, uh, supply price, production capacity or demand, and the ability for organizations to relax those constraints and understand the opportunity cost associated with them um, is, is important. Um, relaxing mm. the um, available capacity uh, relaxing committed demand enables you to understand what the cost of the decisions you have locked into your plan are um, and then potentially taking action to resolve that. Secondly, I think that we're seeing uh, people wanting to explore sort of variation and volatility in their plans, uh, variability of the inputs or the processes. And typically mm. plans are based on uh, a defined input. <clears throat> For example, a supply of X kilos or a, de a demand of Y. And what we're seeing, the ability to explore that variation of the inputs enables people, organizations to understand the likelihood of a certain outcome and the risk profile associated with that. And then they can determine what level of risk they're willing to accept. I sort of classify these two examples as operational type scenario planning. Um, but I think there's also the example of more uh, structural changes uh, either around the operating model or the supply chain. And these also need to get considered in terms of scenario planning. And for example, uh, an unplanned closure to a site um, is a, something that organizations need to think about or potentially loss of access to a market. Um, organizations need to understand what this means to their supply chain, how they're going to respond and what kind continuity plans they're going to put in place in terms of response to that. Yeah, got some great points there, Alma. Yeah, Hamish, do you, do you have a good example from your past of where you used scenario planning effectively? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, so like, 
yeah what i'll talk through is just like sort of i guess the process of how to think about it and and, and bring an example to that at sort of the same time so um the 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 um the example we're going to talk through is um is basically was in terms of drought risk um at the back end of the season so um and and when i mean about drought risk it's it's essentially like did we end up having a dry sort of autumn period um or late summer sort of um autumn period or um did we have a um one where there was kind of normal or above average rainfall um and and in a pastoral farming system that um that would either obviously the drought would drive um less milk production because there'd be um there'd be less grass growth and um whereas a, a, a favorable season would um, drive more grass growth more milk um and um yeah and then and then that would have the impact on sort of the factories and your supply position so um but the the process that i kind of think of it through there's um there's kind of six steps to it so the first one is to develop um and agree what the potential um scenarios that you're going to look at sort of is so so in that example um around um the weather and and the impact on milk um we would look at um a, a variation um of sort of plus or minus a couple of percent um over that summer um autumn period the the next stage is um or the next step is you you run the scenarios and see what potential what the potential implications are um so so that's essentially tra translating it into what what the impact and and so um in the in the case of the the weather impact and um that could equate to um plus or minus fifty thousand metric tons of home power for us um and on around about um, a million tons of home powder um, production sort of annually um, that's five percent um, of of your um, home powder production and and the impact of that is obviously if you, you end up with 50,000 tons more, um, then uh, you, you, you've, uh, you're, you're basically undersold. Whereas if you end up with 50,000 tons less, then you're potentially oversold. So, um, but, so once you've seen what the impact is, um, you then need to determine um, alternative actions and contingencies um, to address those different scenarios. Um, so coming back to the example, um so we'd um we'd look to sort of hold contingency of sales um for an oversold situation um so that means that essentially we would um we would we would have um some product that we would we would hold off selling until it was really clear um whether or not we could uh we'd have everything for that um or you have to have outlets to be able to um, quickly sell additional volume um, if um, if you end up undersold. Um, and then a, another factor or another leave we had was um, being able to change the product mix um, to prioritize key customers um, or products. Um, so th in that case, it's it's about mitigating the impact um, and and um, it, ensuring that um, your sort of high value um, strategic customers are, are impacted the least. So um, then um, um, what I think about is um, you, you've got to identify signposts to indicate that the um, given scenario might occur. Um, and, and the signposts are important just because you need to start enacting um, the, um, the alternative actions once you see that those um, signposts um, uh, sort of start to come into play. So we, we'd monitor long range weather forecasts, um, measurement of rainfall um, in key areas and soil moisture levels. Um, and because again, those were those were kind of key determinants um, uh, in terms of um, the weather impacts. Um, so and then then um, the next step um, is uh, when those occur, um, begin enacting the contingency plans. Um, so um, we would look at removing um, or adding volume uh, to the to a, uh, an auction platform, um, speed up or slow down the sales rate, um, adjust price um, uh, to facilitate um, rebalancing of that, that supply and demand level.
And then the last step is um, review and learn for next time. Um, so, so in this example, we ask questions like, um, did we go too hard or too slow? Um, were there other actions we could, could have taken? Um, and how did the actions taken um, affect the business? So that's kind of it. Um, that, that, that's the example that, um, uh, that I kind of have to live through every year um, uh, in the milk world. Yeah. Alma, maybe um, have you got something from, from your sort of meat experience that you could talk through? Yeah, I, I suppose in terms of the horizons you're looking at there, Hamish, it's, it's quite an extended horizon you're looking at. I think so, some examples that we would have uh, from the meat industry that we, um, in terms of more of a nearer term um, scenario planning example would be just continuously looking at what your kill numbers need to be. The markets are dynamic, pricing is changing, your inventory position is changing, um, how are you, and also obviously your input costs are changing and the need to continuously reevaluate that in terms of, as I spoke to, that sort of first example about relaxing constraints. Yes, you're committing your livestock numbers as you're coming in closer to execution, but the ability to explore and relax those, you actually truly understand what your opportunity costs are of potentially procuring a little bit more or choosing a different procurement strategy. Or similarly, uh, relaxing capacity in your sites, um, the cost of additional shift or securing additional processing capacity. What does that mean in terms of the profitability of your plan? Yeah, I think so, that, I mean, that makes sense. I think one of the. Oh. <laughs> no, um, I, I was going to say, I think what, one of the one of the things that I always think about when you the, the the need for scenario planning, I think everyone realizes, and um, the challenge is, I think if it takes you a very long time and it's very manual to put together a plan in the first place, the idea that you're going to run scenarios um, is kind of overwhelming because you're, you're spending your time just getting a, how can I keep the business afloat plan going? And then to think about, well, what are all the different things that can happen? And that can make people sometimes think that scenarios are either a luxury or something which is kind of for, some, for someone else. It's, it's um, what executives might wanna want you to do, but there's not time in the real world. So I think one of the fundamental things that has to be in place is that ability to have an automated plan. And you, you mentioned it like a digital twin, something where you can have something go through and tell you business as usual, how should things operate? Um, and I think the other really interesting part and where, where I've seen it fall down is there needs to be trust in the underlying data and the assumptions yeah. that are being made. So it all has to be very transparent because the worst thing you can do, you can go to all this work to come up with scenarios. And then instead of talking about the implications or the actions you should take, as you pointed out with, the kind of roads, the signs that tell you when when you need to take an action, what action should you take? The debate becomes, well, what data are you basing that off? <laughs> what 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 are, what are your assumptions? Mm -hmm. If you can't quickly get to that, it this can begin in some cases to feel like just a self-serving process that doesn't really add value. But I think when done well, as you both are pointing out, it can fundamentally affect how you think about your business. Mm. Yeah, you, you like the last thing you want it to be is a tick the box, tick, tick the box exercise, um, and and it's not um, you're not sort of actually using it because I mean the whole idea is that um, you're doing this in order to be able to um, uh, respond quickly um, and and under and or first to have been able to understand the implications of those scenarios, but then respond more quickly as a result. Yeah, and I think and, and I think that's one of the interesting things that we're working with Elmer um, when 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 he was a customer at the time. Um, I think one of the ways that I was really impressed with how he looked at scenarios is thinking of them not just for what if something happens, but to his point about relaxing constraints or changing some business rules. Running scenarios can actually tell you about business as usual. And you can understand some of the cost profitability implications of 
the business rules you've baked into your system. So you could, mm. you've got a vacuum packing line and that's driving a bunch of decision making. And you say, well, what if I turn that constraint off, you know, implying that you're going to maybe get another line or something, how much is that worth to the plan? And so you're not in that case, scenario planning for a, what if you're trying to say, what are the costs of all of my, um, all the assumptions I have in place? How much is it costing me to serve this customer? Their demand is jumping around a lot. Um, I'm having to save extra safety stock. I'm having to hold, um, you know, production time for them. Um, what, if I take that customer out, what does my plan now look like? And so I think there's some really interesting things planning both for contingencies and dramatic events, but also for just understanding fundamentally your capability better. And I think I mean, you, 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 is that roughly what you were alluding to Elmer when you were talking about the relaxing constraints, um, within a scenario? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think, um, as organizations get more mature, you, you see that, that they're able to explore different things. And for us, I suppose the first step is just getting a plan out as you described. Um, I think then the second mm. thing is how can I look at a scenario? And uh, well, what is that scenario? Well, what happens if I get some, I can procure some additional livestock. What does that mean to my fulfillment? Um, and then there, there are those other things that are sometimes a little bit harder to get to. It's about that variation in your plan. Um, and then similarly, those things that are more unique, um, although they're structurally important in terms of the construction of your supply chain, um, it's um, more about, well, what happens, as I said, if a plant goes down, if I lost access to a certain country in terms of a market, what does that do to my plan? And some of those things are, are more strategic in nature as opposed to more operational in nature. Yeah, I, I've even heard some of our customers talk about the fact that their customers are starting to ask some questions that are really best solved through scenarios. I mean, to your point, we know that the supply chain disruptions are happening. I'm an important customer of yours. I want to know what happens if a plant goes down or what happens if there's a supply chain disruption, do I get taken care of um, or not? And, you know, starting to see, you know, at what point do things break down um, and, and having a system in place where you can start to run that and say, well, as a valued customer, we have policies in place. Here's how they get executed under a variety of disruptions. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's, that's a, I kind of, that's maybe to your point, that's taking this scenario planning to, to one level deeper. Um, I, I think it's a, an, an interesting use case. Do you have any other kind of interesting ways, Hamish, where you where, where having done scenario planning, it changed maybe how you thought about the business? Does that, if that makes sense? Um, yeah. Um, let me just, yeah, let me just think about that for a little bit. Um, um, While Hamish is uh, thinking of an example, Elmer, you right. and I had a conversation recently about the importance of change management. How does that play into switching a business around to take into account scenario planning as opposed to just in time supply chain? Yeah, I think. Um, I think as Simon and Hamish have alluded to, I think the need for scenario planning is understood by everyone in the business. Uh, but I think the key thing is for them to see value out of it um, and to buy into it. Um, so I think Simon talked about this having trust in the numbers. I think the first thing is if you've got a plan that people trust, they understand how it's constructed. Um, that then enables you to talk, sort of take the next step to say, well, let's explore some of the scenarios about around this plan. And so that then brings them into that process and um, enables them to sort of trust the outputs of those scenarios and the outputs and the recommendations that come from those plans and then help them uh, build their capability, organizational capability and knowledge that can help sort of drive deeper thinking about how do we respond to those challenges that we're seeing. 
Mm. Yeah, like yeah, in terms of that example around sort of how how it, um, I've seen it sort of change business and impact on that um, was that um, basically sort of as as um, pricing became more volatile, so supply restrictions um, sort of came off in Europe. Um, the, the government stocks ran down in, in um, the USA um, sort of rack around sort of that um, 2008, 2009 period. Um, we, we just started to see the volatility and the um, distribution of prices in dairy um, start to expand a lot more. So um, so we, we started to bring that in and sort of saying, well, what was the implication on, on our sales book um, if, price, if prices could go up to... 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and what if it could do it? Um, and also how quickly could it do it? Um, would it take a, a year to do it? Would it take um, three months? Would it take six months? Um, and, and and obviously like if it, if it goes really high, really quick, um, then um, potentially your what happens is your sales book ends up quite, or the, the, the price that you're getting from the sales that you have, um, when you look at it from an invoicing perspective, um, you could have a big lag um, in there. Um, and um, yeah, that, that lag could be quite painful um, is, is what we saw both through the scenario planning, but also um, in, in practice. Um, and, and so that, that sort of drove realization that um, if, if volatility was, was higher and here to stay, which now looking back sort of um, 10 years um it, it was well then then you need to think differently about how you price um so so sort of prior to that increase in volatility we we had some um we, we did a lot of long range deals we might price it for for the next 12 months or we might have a rolling average and it could have been looking back um to using the average price over the last two or three years to determine the price next month um, so we took a lot of that out, or we essentially took all of that out. Um, we we reduced what I call the contract tenor to, to three months. So basically, we'd um, we'd only contract out the next three months, um, and then roll out the next three months. We no longer do twelve month price deals. Um, we we moved to a lot more sort of index pricing. Um, so so pricing against um, global dairy trade. Um, became a really significant sort of part of, of what we did. Um, and, um, and, and then we'd put a variety of other sort of structures around it too um, that would both um, protect us and protect the customer. Um, so, yeah, so that was, it was that one was a pretty um, painful lesson, um, really, that uh, in terms of what, what happens. Um, but um, by having sort of looked at it and thought about it sort of ahead of time, um, we were able to sort of move to that relatively quickly. Hey, Mish, um, this scenario yeah. planning stuff doesn't come yeah. easily for a business. I think, Simon, it'd be interesting to hear from you around from a technical or tools point of view, what does, how, how can systems help um, scenario planning? And the process around it yeah i mean I, similar to what i was saying i mean the, the the first thing that is needed is that baseline plan you, you you have to have something in place where you've got that consensus view of the organization your capabilities your sales capability your production that needs to be in place and then um i think it's really an acknowledgement that it's worth spending some time thinking about um, what are the big factors that drive profitability and um, where do you have gaps between what your customers are asking for and what you can what you can provide what's the value in that gap and then really from an executive team point of view challenging the people that are coming up with plans to say can you do better how can we close that gap what are some improvements we can make and really getting that 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 cycle in place where there's there's a there's a goal to both find the problem and then come up with plans to close that gap and actually you know provide some financial metrics around what are some improvements we can be making so there are some actions you can take 
there's some benefits you can expect and you're know, baking that into a, a regular cycle so that you don't feel as a user of the system i'm coming up with scenarios who's going to listen to me you, you've got the trust in the system you then need to start having kind of executive buy-in that it's worth taking actions where there's a um, measurable roi Yeah, I think for me, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that the critical things from my perspective also, I think those points really resonate, Simon. I think really for a business, as you said, to create that baseline plan that's trusted, uh, that you can compare against, um, that's critically important. And to have a cadence that generates that baseline plan. But also then for the business to start to think about what are those levers that create or protect value, yeah, that need to get managed. Um, and this takes some time. It, it doesn't happen. Systems don't make that happen. That that takes people applying their brains to the problems that the organisations need to solve. And I think the third point is really it needs to be part of the DNA of the business, the operating cadence that scenarios are explored. It's not just okay to have a baseline anymore. Um, you need to respond to a changing environment and you need to evaluate all of those possible, a range of those possible outcomes, yeah? So to use the scenario planning to manage your business, to manage your risk in, in operating your business, um, controlling that outcome, but also taking advantage of the opportunities that come from that changing environment and the scenarios that are presented to you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my my kind of top sort of three takeaways um, for, for people kind of listening is that, um, like, if you want to be able to sort of do this, like digitizing, digitizing your supply chain is really critical to responding more rapidly. Um, Excel just doesn't cut it um, anymore. Um, the second point would be um, advanced scenario capabilities allow you to prepare for those unknowns because you can run multiple scenarios um, with with different levels in those scenarios um, and then you've got to take action so you must build those contingencies in um, and have identified the signposts um, for when you will start enacting those contingencies because it's all very well and good to have a plan and have scenarios but you've actually got to do something with it um, at the end of the day otherwise it's just um, kind of navel gazing <laughs> Simon, as, as the boss, do you want to have a, a last word or contribution? <laughs> um, well, no, I, 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 I hope this conversation um, was, was useful to people. Um, and um, as you can tell, the, the, the helping to manage these volatile supply chains is something we're all really passionate about. And I think that you know, the recognition from this team, from people who've, you know, worked as either like myself, software vendors, or people who've been in the industry like Elmer and Hamish, it's critical to have that capability embedded within an organization. And it takes more than just a technology. It is a, a people and a process, um, just as, as everyone says. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, well, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, it's